It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. should boast save in the death of Christ my God all the vain things that charm me most I sacrifice them to In Psalm 115, I wanted to read the whole thing for responsive reading, because wasn't it good? Isn't that a good chapter? To me, it's like I was reading it, I was like, this is, this is our life right now. Starting in verse 1, look at verse 1, Psalm 15, verse 1, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. That's what we want. We don't want glory out of any of this hubbub. We want glory to go to God. And we keep that as the light, that we're, as, the, as our north star. Is God getting glorified through this or not? Is his word getting out or not? Many in this world are trying to toot their own horns and bring uh, glory to a cause or to a sin. Christians are worried about giving glory to God. That's where our minds will stop. Look at verse 2. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Some people are wondering if our God is real. He's real. He's real. If they don't admit to it now, they'll, they'll find out later on that the God of the Bible is real. Their idols, it says in verse 4, are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. This is talking about the world's idols. They don't have, they don't have the ability to speak anything what people idolize today. Look at verse 5. Uh, 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 excuse me, 6. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. These false idols. This morning's sermon, I want to talk about bowing down before God and not before idols. We'll come back to it. Let's read it out. Look at verse 8. Or excuse me, verse 9. O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Brett, 
trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Oh, house of Pat. Oh, house of whoever's here this morning. Take that verse to heart. Amen. Trust in the Lord. He is your help and your shield. It says in verse 13, he will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. You are blessed of the Lord, which made heaven and earth. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's. But the earth hath he given to the children of men. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. But we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. God opens doors and no man shutteth. And while this door is open at... 8th and 8th and Lewiston, we're going to praise the Lord to the best of our ability and preach His truth. My sermon, as I just said, though, is I want to talk about idolatry. We have a real God, but the world sets up these idols of silver and gold. And these idols of silver and gold, the work of men's hands, do nothing for nobody. Except, extract, except distract from the true God, the living God. I want to start this sermon. I want to talk about four different idols we see in our world today. And I want to start with the first one being a big elephant in our world, elephant in the room. The idol of sin. The idol of sin. I want to speak into this a little bit before I give you a passage to turn to. But I want to think about this. Most sins today in our world are still seen by most people as bad, right? Most sins. I mean, there's no one throwing parades for drunkards, right? Not happening. There's no one saying we need to accept liars because God made them that way. No one's saying that, right? People still view lying as wrong, drunkenness as wrong. There's no one making children's cartoons that say that adultery is okay, right? I hope they're not. Who knows? On some stations. There's no month designated to promoting the sin of covetousness, is there? No. But the sin of sodomy, and the sermon's not on, all, not on this topic completely, so relax. I know the world thinks it's all we talk about. I'll mention it now because we've got people watching and I want them to know the truth, Right? The sin of sodomy is a different kind of sin because now it is put on a pedestal. So, the LGBTQ sins, what I'm talking about. It's different. With this sin, we are asked to not speak against it. Even from our own pulpits, in our own private lives as citizens of this free nation, we're asked not to speak against it. In fact, it's becoming an increasing requirement that we celebrate it. Right? You see it on your calendars now. You see it every um, athlete, every uh, sporting event, the Olympics. They're all pushing us to celebrate and get behind sin. This is a different kind of sin we're facing today. It's an idol is what it's become. The idol that is the LGBTQ sin. They're asking us to bow down before it. I'm telling you, they really are. They want us to bow down um, even in our churches, even in our personal lives, even in our homes, even in our pulpits. Well, I want to tell you, Christians are not to bow down before anything except God and certainly not supposed to bow down before sin. I want to look at this and it's the only time we'll talk about it and then we'll move on. But please look at Romans chapter 1. If you come to our services, you'll find we, we talk on all kinds of sins. And we convict ourselves in all kinds of ways. But just for a moment, please bear with me as we preach truth in this world. Romans chapter 1 and verse 25. I always ask God to give me wisdom to speak things so that the young ears aren't offended. And I trust he'll, he'll give me wisdom. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 25, please. If you're with us in Sunday school, you understand how important the whole book of Romans is. Very vital book for faith. It's all important, but boy, you learn a lot in Romans, don't you? Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. 
This is what I mean, worshiping sin, bowing down before sin as an idol. That verse right there. And what is this? What is this sin that Romans says our world will worship? Look at verse 26. For this cause, God gave them up into vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. The world is really trying, I'm sorry, to hang all Christians these days, including myself. And they're really trying to get me on that word vile. Well, I believe every word, every word in the word of God is inspired by God, preserved by God. I believe that's still the right word. And I'm not going to back down from it. Christians, put yourselves behind the word of God and use those words. It's a safe place to be. You know why? Because one day when you answer to God, you're going to say, well, God, I just stuck to the word you used. And God's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. To the ones who say, well, I got ashamed of the words you used, then God's going to say, well, why were you ashamed of me and my gospel? You see that earlier in the chapter in verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Don't be ashamed of God and his words. That word vile means wicked. It means in a common dictionary, I looked up the 1828, I guess not common so much anymore, but wicked, extremely depraved, proceeding from extreme depravity. Vile, it's a, it's a deep word. Look at verse 27. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their heir which was meat. <clears throat> that word unseemly. Another important word, it means unbecoming, it means indecent. This sin is one that is vile and unseemly, extremely wicked and indecent. But the world says it is sin that should be celebrated, paraded, not spoken against. This sin has become an idol in our world today. I want to point out before we move on from this passage what it says at the end of verse 27. Not many ministers will because they fear man, but let us fear God and preach his word. The end of verse 27 says, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their heir which was meat. That means that from this lifestyle, from this sin, you receive in yourself, that is in your body, judgment, recompense, consequences for your action in your body. You know, we have a phrase in our world today that is follow the science, trust the science, right? Everybody's heard it with all this, with all this mass stuff going on. Trust the science. Well, I looked up the CDC website because I'm going to follow the science, okay? This is a quote. CDC quote. In 2018, the most recent study, in 2018, gay and bisexual men made up 69% of the 37,968 new HIV diagnoses in the United States and dependent areas. Approximately 492 a thousand sexually active gay and bisexual men are at high risk for HIV. That's a CDC statistic that says that 69% of HIV, a terrible disease, I would not wish it on anyone. I would not. A terrible disease, 69% of them, according to CDC's numbers, which are probably biased, but even according to that, it says are among that gay and bisexual population. This is just what the Bible is saying. But I do not see all the warning messages. I don't see all the commercials. I don't see, you know, we warn about smoking. We warn about COVID. There's no warning about this. And I want to tell you something out of love. I want to tell you another fact here. Do you know the most impacted group from HIV? The most impacted group among that 69% each year? The age group is this. From the age group of 13 to 34 are the most likely to be infected by that disease. 13 to 34. 
So 13-year-old boys are getting this incurable disease because nobody had the love to tell them that it's wrong. That it's sin with consequences spelled out plainly in the Word of God and even spelled out plainly in science. This is malpractice in our nation. This is malpractice in doctors, in governments, in churches to not warn about the consequences of sin anymore. I'll go a step forward, forward further. This is child abuse. That we would set these young boys up that by the time they're 13, they just might catch this incurable disease. This is called child abuse. There would be no other disease that would not be on the world's radar that, oh my goodness, make sure these boys do not get this disease. It would be on billboards. It would be on TV commercials. Let's make sure our young boys don't get this disease. But why? No, they hide it because it's now an idol of sin and glorification of sin. I'll go a step further. This not telling the world about this sin and the reality of it is hate. Love is warning of sin and the consequences of sin. I'll stand by it. The world, though, says let's bow down before this destructive, anti-God, anti-what is natural, according to what the Bible says, vile sin. Please look at Daniel chapter 3. The whole sermon's not on this. It's just an example of an idol our world sets up. And boy, is it the idol today. Daniel chapter 3. I've got like three big chapters that I want to read a bunch of verses on. So hopefully you like reading the Bible with me this morning. Not going to go a bunch of little places, three big places. Look at Daniel chapter 3, and I want to read this whole chapter. Shall we jump in together? Look at this. It's an example of bowing down to the idol of sin. 3 1. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon, that wicked land Babylon too. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors and the captains, the judges and the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image of which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Named a lot of people there, didn't it? A lot of occupations, didn't it? A lot of people on the dole, isn't it? A lot of people funded and they've got to hold these positions for their livelihood. What keeps people today from speaking out? I'm sorry. What keeps sheriffs, business owners, public employees from speaking out as private citizens? Fear of bullies. Fear of bullies and that bullies will take their livelihood away. At the end of the day, it's a love of money. But pray, folks, that we have to have people that aren't afraid about losing their livelihood. We're going to get to that in a second about the idol that is money. But I hope we have governors and sheriffs and magistrates who will stand on principle. Stand on morality. That's what we need. That's who we need to elect. That's who we need ruling. Not those who are just trying to maintain their livelihood, their paycheck. Look at verse 4, or excuse me, verse 3. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together into the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, all like good people, good citizens, all unified around this ungodly statue. Look at verse 4. Then a herald cried aloud, to you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sack, butt, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. 
And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, and worshipeth, shall the same hour be cast in the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sack, but psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Oh my goodness, what a land. All the people are bowing down in this idolatry to worship the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. You can learn something from this. We can learn something from this, can't we? Just because everyone's bowing down didn't make it right, did it? All these important people, I mean, the sheriff's doing it. The, the, the governors, the, the magistrates, these people are all bowing down. Doesn't mean everybody should do it. And guess what, friends? There's a few men here who don't do it. Let's see these, these few men who don't do it. Look at verse 8. Wherefore, that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flutes, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. It sounds lovely, doesn't it? They've got all this wonderful music going on and, and you feel it and the emotions come over. You bow down and you worship at the feet of this golden statue. 11. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Look at this. These tattletales, these people who really just want to move up in their own lives. They want more for themselves, and they know the king rules the land, so let's appease the king. They are tattletaling on these three men who have conviction that there's only one God, and only one God should be worshipped. Only one God should be bowed down before, and it's God on the throne. God in heaven, God that made heaven and earth. These three men have conviction. They're going to stand up. Our world today plays out just like this. The idol of the LGBTQ lifestyle is up on a pedestal. And now it's positioned such that everyone's got to join in with it. And that mantra and that theme and that campaign, or you're going to lose something. Think about it. Why do all the big companies now run these commercials? Why is it, right? They want to make more money. They just see this as a sin on a pedestal. The devil's behind it all. They jump in and they're going to push this along. And pretty soon it's the law of the land that, boy, you better start bowing to these things. We need men and women to stand up and be courageous again. On principle. On the word of God. They tattletale. They say that these certain Jews... They're over the affairs of the province. These Jews, they hold some positions of authority, and they're like, King, these guys are hurting the unity of the land, right? They're hurting the message that you're sending out. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego no longer allowed to hold their own faith, are they? They've got to bow to the sin of the land. We're there. We're there. In America, we're there. Look at verse... 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Now Nebuchadnezzar's all mad, but Nebuchadnezzar was the one that appointed them before. But he's all worked up now. Look at 14. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? People want us to worship the creature more than the creator, don't they? People want us to glorify man more than we glorify God. And the rubber absolutely hits the road with sin. Something God despises, we are not to call good. It stops there, doesn't it? 
Look at 15. Now, if you be ready that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? I would love to hear, hear the side comments at this point. There's probably some people saying, yeah, the whole land is really unifying together. And we're, we're all coming together. And for the first time, we're enjoying each other's company. And there's no arguments. And we're all just bound to the foot of Nebuchadnezzar. And there's these three people, hateful people, causing this kind of division, right? This is how it played out then, I'm sure, or now. I'm speculating. Three people causing divisions. I'm sure there were probably some that said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you are so hateful. You are so prideful. Why can't you just get on board with where the world's going? Stop being a caveman, okay? Can't you evolve like the rest of us? And the same crowd that calls them hateful is about to do what? Throw them into the fiery furnace. Because that's a gesture of love and acceptance and tolerance, isn't it? <laughs> Some things don't change in this world. God doesn't change. The Bible doesn't change. And sin nature doesn't change. People are still fighting against Almighty God and this book that tells them they're living wrong. Look at verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. I love that phrase. Not careful. You see, sometimes when other people address a king, you'll find, I don't know if you see like in Joseph's answers or, I can't, I know it's in Bible, but they'll say, I'm careful to answer thee, O king. These guys say, we're not careful. Look at their answer. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. They're, they're not careful. I think they're saying in their heads, O king, we've respected and obeyed you all the way up until the point that you started telling us to start disobeying God. And then it made our job really easy. We said, at this juncture, we're going to keep obeying God, and then your word means nothing to us. We hit that juncture today in life, don't we? As Christians, we live um, as wise as serpents, as harmless as doves. We go the extra mile. We are good workers. We are good neighbors, good citizens. But when they tell us to disobey our God, we say, I'm not going to have to be careful about this answer. The answer is no. I'm going to keep serving God. CDC tells us, good time to stop having church because of, the, uh, because of uh, COVID. We said, nah, 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 nah. That's running into God telling me to not forsake the assembly ourselves together. We say, no. They say, well, you need to stop preaching this in your private capacity as a private citizen. And I say, ah, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> I, I had that conversation recently with, with uh, superiors. And I, you know me. I'm actually very, very careful. I try to be very respectful. But at that moment, it was like... This is an easy one. I don't need to even drop and pray about this. I'm going to keep preaching the Word of God. I'm not going to back down from the Word of God. I'm not going to bow at the feet of sin, no matter how many people are bowing. None of us should. Because we have this thing called God, 18. But if not, be it known to thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Think, keep that verse in your mind. You know, the, the marvel, the wonder is the faith that Shadrach and Meshach have because the land they're living in is even worse than ours. I mean, it's already in their books, in the law right here. You, you don't worship their gods. You go in the fiery furnace. Christians need to gird up their loins today. My wife and I have this conversation all the time. We really do. That if we can't stand right now when the laws are on the books, that we still are allowed to preach and exercise religion and free speech. And if we can't do it now, we are nothing but cowards. Because in 20 years, in I don't know how many years, but our kids will probably have to stand up when the laws have changed. And now that's hate speech. It's against our new law. And now you can't say it in your pulpit. You can't say it in your private life. And then they'll really have to have courage to stand up. We are cowards. And I'm sorry. Christians are cowards. 
all across America, all across our state, all across our valley. I'm not naming names, but people need to stand on God's word again. Look what happens to him. I'm reading this for the faithful. I'm reading this for the faithful so you know you can stand up and be okay. Look at 19. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury. He's mad at their answer. And the form of his visage, visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. There's no way out. No hiding. These men are simply going to have to trust God. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hose and their hats and their other garments and were cast in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Some mealy-mouthed, lukewarm Christians today probably were like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, just bow, just get along, and then you'll be able to stand and you'll keep sharing your faith in your own time quietly over there in the corner and you'll be just fine, just bow like we bow. <laughs> no, never compromise your faith in God and His Word. The better way is always to live out your faith boldly. Because watch what happens. 22, therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was a stony and rose up in haste and spake and said to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood with God. And now God will stand with them. When we preach tonight on the Jordan River, a big thrust of it will be that Christians today are never seeing a Jordan River open up. They're never seeing a Red Sea. They're never seeing an angel next to them in a fiery furnace because we're not living out our faith. The, the Word of God comes alive. Your faith comes alive when you step out by faith. That's the blessed life. But we cower up and we don't see these wonderful things happen. They are literally standing now with God. Son of, like in the Son of God. 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. Amen. And the princes, governors, and captains, the king's counselors being gathered together, saw these men, upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was in hair of their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire passed on them. All the men who had bowed down to the other God now see the power of the real God. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Praise the Lord. That's revival in Babylon. The king, the one who promoted the false god, he says... <laughs> They have, found, they have the real God. And these men have yielded their bodies to serving the real God. Friends, do you realize that when God puts you up and puts a spotlight on you, you have two choices. Cower up, clam up, and let the world and Satan win. Or stand on God's word and let God work and let God get the glory. We're at a pivotal moment here. Yes, we put our lives in jeopardy a little bit in this age. But friends, I think we have in the year 2021 more opportunity to see God do something big than we've seen in a lot of years past. He works in big ways when persecution is out in big ways. But this never happens if Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego just go with the flow. Go with the current. 
bow down like everybody else, live to fight another day. He says in verse 29, Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces. Here's a new law. And their houses shall be made a dunghill because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. I want people to see the real God. I want people close to me. I want people in my life to see the real God. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. They did not bow down to that idol of sin, did they? Why? They had faith. The same attribute we can have today. Look at Luke chapter 16, please. Luke 16. I want to now mention three more idols, types of idols. We talked about bowing before sin, and everybody in the congregation is like, yeah, I'm not going to bow down before the sin. You're preaching to the choir. Well, amen. I'm right with you. We'll stand together strong, not bow before sin. But I want to mention three idols that Christians do sometimes bow down to. And sometimes they bow down to these three idols without even realizing that their knees are on the ground. Let's look at this. Look at Luke 16, verse 13. Please. 16, 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon means riches, money, wealth, okay? This passage is speaking to the idol of money. Money is an idol that true Christians, I, I don't doubt their faith, true Christians bow, though, at this idol of money. And it's, it becomes what they serve with their life. Instead of giving their life to God, they give their life to the pursuit of money, to financial freedom, to financial stability, to, you know, comfort, planning ahead for their retirement. None of those things necessarily terrible in themselves, but if that's your whole life and that's what you become serving, then it's an idol. I want to make a point, and I want to hearken back what I said earlier. What keeps the sheriffs, the business owners, small businesses, you know, public employees in their own private time, what keeps them from standing on God's word? Oftentimes, it's that paycheck. Got to have it. Can't lose it. Can't live without it. That sounds like I'm describing God, doesn't it? You can't live without God. You can live without that paycheck. You can live without that retirement plan. You can. You can even live without that insurance plan. You can. I'm trying to make an easy point here. Well, easy, but it takes faith. My point is this. Until you give your finances to God, you will always give your life to your finances. This is true. You, it's, a, it's like a, this topic, money, is really one of those bumps in the road that you've got to get over or you'll, you'll never get over. It's like a hurdle. Until you decide that you're going to give your financial situation, your everyday bread, right? The shirt on your back. Can he clothe you like he clothes the grass? Until you give it to God, you'll spend your whole life turning your wheels, taking care of this financial situation. And that's not how Christians need to live. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, all those financial things, shall be added unto you. Your livelihood, yes, you work hard, you work by the sweat of your brow to feed your family, absolutely, but that is not job number one in your life. Your job number one is serving God. And as you serve God, He'll take care of these needs. I don't know how else to say it other than if you struggle in that area, just read the Bible. It tells us that we don't need to make that priority number one. If you keep your beliefs to yourself, I'm thinking about this in our valley. I'm thinking about this, you know, who's come to 
reach out with some support and who hasn't and i'm not keeping a note and getting back at people i'm not doing that but who's come to support or not a lot of them that i know have conservative principles and they're going to stand on the constitution and our god-given rights they're silent and i think a lot of it has to do with this serving money concept if you have to keep your beliefs to yourself for fear of losing customers for fear of losing a position for fear of losing a contract you are the problem i'm not talking about speaking on the job you know i preach this all the time so no one can hang me on it when you are on the job you're there to work okay so i'm not saying when you're dealing with a customer you're gonna rebuke them about some sin you're not you're gonna give them the product you're gonna give them the service because the whole world is, needs this, right? This is how we live, make our livings. But when you are on your own time later on, at your Sunday service, at your home, at your study group, at whatever, and you still got to hold back your belief that something is wrong, you're a part of the problem. You're not part of the solution. I'm talking about silence 24 7. When do you speak? You know, the world right now is looking at me, and I'm not, I don't like to talk about me, but right now people are talking about me a little bit. But they want me, there's some, I read an article this morning in our, in our lovely paper. The article read, or the, the letter the editor said, that I should be silent 24-7 with my faith. 24-7, seven days a week, I should not be sharing my faith because of my position I hold at my place of work. Okay, <laughs> I want to tell you, you could never pay me enough for that to happen. Amen. Give me 17 million dollars. I'm not going to give up my faith and my right to share my faith. But in some people's minds, that's a thing. Well, we, we give you this job and it's an important job and we pay you this money. So that means you need to bow down to it 24 seven. There is no such job. And if you think there is such a job, you get yourself out of that job and go make tents somewhere. I don't know. Find a new trade. McDonald's is hiring 15 bucks an hour. Go for it. I'm looking at it now. You know, you never know what I'll need. Don't give up your faith for money. The Bible says in Proverbs eleven twenty eight, He that trusteth in his riches shall fall, but the righteous shall flourish as a branch. What I mean, just read through the Proverbs. It'll tell you all the things you need to know about money. Look at verse 14, please. I want to I mention a second idol. 14. And the Pharisees also who were covetous heard all these things, and they derided him. Then he said to them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. Amen. This Bible's true. We haven't lost any of it. We still got the preserved word of God in our hands. But in verse 15, I think we see another idol. This idol of the esteem of men. It's the other idol I want to talk about. People can spend, Christians can spend their lives seeking money. Christians can spend their lives seeking the praise of men. It really can happen. I'll be honest, I can fall into this idol. I really can. I could fall into it tomorrow. Well, I've really got to have these people like and accept me. They really got to think I'm smart and that I'm moral and I'm good and all that. And it does not matter what people think. The esteem of men does not matter. What we want is the esteem of Almighty God. Right now, there are many people saying that me and my life in this church, we're not justified in our actions. We're not justified in what we preach. Well, I'm not looking to be justified in their eyes. Are we justified in the eyes of Almighty God? Don't worry about if the world approves of you and your words. Worry about does God approve of you and your words? Is your life in line with God's word here that doesn't pass away? The praise of men. This seeps down into all areas of your life. Worrying about what people think more than what God thinks. The fear of man brings a snare. Whereas the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Another simple lesson, but Christians trip on this hurdle of trying to be loved by this ungodly world. 
Let me read you a verse in John chapter 12. John 12, 42 says, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. That's Christ. Among the chief rulers, many believed on Christ, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. And then it goes on to say in verse 43, For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. That's a travesty. In John 12, it talks about these chief rulers, prominent positions. They believed on Christ, but because they feared the Pharisees, they stayed quiet. They stayed mum. They loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. They could not put their roles in the synagogue at jeopardy. Christ was not happy. Idol, the second idol here is the praise of men. Let me show you a third idol here in Luke 16 and verse 18. 16, 18 says, Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. The third idol I want to mention in this chapter is the idol of family. The idol of family. And I use this verse as a springboard simply because I see this happening more and more and more and more. You can find people devout in their faith in the Word of God, but when you show them that actually it's wrong to put away your wife and marry another, then they balk and they bow at the feet of family. I say, well, you know, I got this new wife, and, uh, but the first one I married, that was years ago, and it was wrong, and now I got this new wife, and that's, uh, it's, it's, we got a kid together, and now this is more important than the Word of God. They bow at the feet of family instead of obeying what the Bible says. That topic is very clear, divorce or marriage. It's not a topic I'm going to delve into this morning, but I want to use it as an example of people putting family above God and His Word. It's another idol that we bow before. If you would, though, I want to bring you to the story here from 19 to verse 31. Because now we've got folks here, and I don't know what everybody believes. I don't know if you know the Lord is your Savior. But I want you to think about this story from 19 to 31. It's one of the most vivid examples of what happens when you die. Watch with me. 19 says, There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple, and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which laid at his, feet, excuse me, laid at his gate full of sores. I want you to realize something already. This is not a parable. When Christ talks about parables, he never uses proper nouns. He never names names. He also, if it's a parable, he would give the meaning of the parable, but he doesn't. This is a historical account and one of the most clearest accounts of what happens when you die and what happens when you die and you don't have Christ as your Savior. Rich man in verse 19, a poor man in verse 20. Look at 21, and, the, and Lazarus, this poor man, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. Two men, two different lives. One man has got a very nice life, very wealthy in this world, very well-to-do, things going well. Lazarus has nothing going for him. He is poor, his health is bad this is their lot in this life but i want to tell you the richer of the two is lazarus because you'll find he's rich in faith he's rich in belief in almighty god and that's the wealth that matters look at verse 22 and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into abraham's bosom the rich man also died and was buried. Think about this. The beggar dies and he's carried into Abraham's bosom. We know that this in this text means a place called paradise. Before Christ dies on the cross and sheds his blood, believers went to a place called paradise or Abraham's bosom, okay? This is where Lazarus goes to a place of comfort. 
The rich man died, though, and says he's buried. Now look here, verse 23. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. The way the scriptures, I believe, teaches it is that paradise was in the center of the earth. And in paradise, there was one side in the center of the earth that was paradise. That's where Lazarus is at. And in the other side was hell. And in fact, they could look across and see one another. And it says that this rich man is looking across at Abraham, who had died many, many years ago. But there is Abraham living in pleasure. And there is Lazarus living in pleasure and comfort. And this rich man is in pain. Look at 24. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. This is a story that Jesus Christ is telling, a historical account. We need to ask why is Jesus Christ telling us this story? Because he's giving us a picture of reality. When a believer dies and when a non-believer dies. Friends, this story is something that should ignite your heart to serve the Lord. This poor man, rich man, is an example of the believers you know and the unbelievers you know. Who's got unbelievers in their family? I do. Who's got unbelievers in their neighborhood? I do. Unbelievers throughout our world. I'm telling you, this is their future, Christ tells us. A place of torment in flame. He is thirsty. This means hell is a very literal place with flame and torment. Discomfort. 25. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise, Laz likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. <laughs> Abraham, from this position in the center of the earth, preaches a little mini sermon there. He says, rich man, you spent your whole life trying to be as comfortable as you could. You got what you were after. You won in that life during those 70, 80 years you lived. Lazarus, though, sought something eternal. Sought a savior. Belief in a God. Belief in a Messiah. Belief in a way to heaven. Abraham preaches a sermon. Look at 26. And beside all this between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us, that they would come from thence. There's a big gulf, a divider between paradise and hell. And there's no going between. This paints a picture of what happens in the future. In the future, what God makes is a place called the lake of fire and a place called heaven, kingdom, heaven. And there's a big gulf between the two, and there's no going between. Some people like to say that we're going to, you know, pray or we'll be baptized for the dead and we'll pray them up into heaven. That ain't happening. There ain't no purgatory position in the middle. There's a great gulf between heaven and hell. And it's either one or the other. Where Lazarus goes or the rich man goes. And that's what your family is facing right now. That's what our valley is facing right now. It says in verse 27, Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. Listen, this is the rich man saying, Please send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. It's, this passage is so, it's such an illustration of reality. People in hell, people who go to hell, they have real pain. They have real pain. They have real consciousness. They have real regret. And I want to show you here that in hell, they finally have concern for the souls of others. You know, that's what we have today as true Christians, do we not? People look at our church and say, oh, you're just you're spewing things that are mean and angry, and that's what you're doing it for because you like to be mean and angry. No, we are saying the Word of God because we have concern for souls. 
And we know the deception of sin and of riches and of family can twist people's mind and get them off of the Word of God. But boy, we are the ones who love people because we don't want them to go to hell when they die. Finally, by the time that you're in this rich man's position, finally do you have concern for the souls of others. Abraham says in verse 29, And Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. The rich man says, We need someone to rise up from the grave and go tell them that this place is real. We need someone to go tell them this, this hell is real. They weren't kidding. Real. Abraham's answer is, It's right there on the page of Scripture. And if they don't believe when the Bible says it, they won't believe, though one rose from the dead. Friends, we have this same Bible. It's just as true on the page of Scripture. It's just as true. People are going to die and go to hell because they don't believe in the Savior, because they believe the lies of this world. And where are Christians in all of this? I'm sorry, many Christians have become the rich men, busy trying to live comfortably, busy bowing to idols so they can hold their position. Busy chasing the dollar so they can stay in that kind of level of comfort. Christians are, are a big reason. True Christians are a big reason why our world is going down the drain. I, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an equal offender. The cause of sin and the, and the devil's wicked lies is, is terrible, right? Causing our world to go down the drain. False prophets that stand behind all these pulpits now are a big reason our world is going down the drain. And all that a third, and that is the Christian who keeps his mouth shut, is also a reason why this world is going down the drain. This is the true reality. I ask your friend, I asked it on Wednesday night. I asked, do you know the Lord as your Savior? Okay? And, and I don't mean, do you know the Lord as something nice and good and did a pretty good job and you're trying to do a good job yourself. That is in no way salvation. Why do I say that works are in no part salvation? Be only because the Word of God says it. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, you look it up yourself. Watch our Sunday school, please. We talked about it. Watch Wednesday night. We talked about it. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There is salvation. But people try to work their way, and it's a sure ticket to hell. You telling me this rich man didn't try to do some good things? You bet he did. I'll bet you, I bet you he gave some stuff to the poor. I'll bet you he was nice, a family man, a nice man in the community. But you see here, he went straight to hell because he did not believe in the Messiah. He did not trust in anyone to pay for his sins in blood. I wanted to read this passage because I think this reality ties to everything what I'm saying today. And it should give this reality of hell should give you every reason to get up off your knees at whatever idol you're bowing to and start taking your service for the Lord seriously. To close, I want to close over here in Matthew chapter 10. I'm sorry if my sermons are getting a little longer lately. <laughs> Last week there was a group waiting for us to go out the doors. And the joke inside our building was, they don't know how long he preaches. <laughs> I lived up to my name last week, right? Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16. I started in Psalm 115, kind of a, a passage for believers to be encouraged. And I want to get comfort out of this passage as well. But I think in Matthew chapter 10, you see both encouragement for believers and sound instruction for believers. For folks who don't want to bow before idols. Look at verse, let's start at 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. I want every one of you to live that. I don't want us to make mistakes. I don't want us to give reasons for the adversary to speak repro reproachfully. They're searching out iniquities now. But I also don't want you to live a silent life. 
I want us to believe and therefore speak. Look at verse 17. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. Kind of sounds like what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were going through. But when they deliver you up, take no thought for how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not that ye, excuse me, for it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Stay close to God. And when, you, when you've got to speak, God's going to give you words. He's been giving me some words lately. 21, and the brother shall deliver up the brother to death. And the father, the child, and the child shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. I said I was going to come back to that idol that is the family. Well, I'm coming back to it here. I have talked to people this week, and you know what I've heard? I've heard two different stories from two different people. I saw one man, I'm not naming names at all. One man has lived a life, and I'll just be frank, not serving the Lord. Maybe he's saved, I don't know. But living in shallow churches, not serious about this book, not serious about living out his faith, and teaching his children and the admission of the Lord. And guess what? His children now have turned to the ways of Sodom. Now, I'm not happy, but it's terrible. Turn the way of Sodom. And his response, though, now is I'm going to bow down to this lifestyle that they have and accept this lifestyle. Because they're my kids, I'm going to love them and I'm going to bow down to this sin. I've always known sin's wrong, but now because it's in my own family, I'm going to say I'm going to bow down before it. I'm telling you, that's your idol, is your family. And no, I don't think that is fruit for salvation. I met another man, though, again, not naming any names. Same story, and I'm going to be honest, I think he lived the same way this man did. Not serious about his faith, not living out the Bible, in wishy-washy, lukewarm churches, and his children now have gone the way of Sodom. Quite really, quite fully. But praise the Lord, this man, I heard him say something that inspired me. He says, I'm not going to bow down to that sin. He says, it's wrong. Even if it's in my family, it's still wrong. We need, I know, it gets hard when it hits your family, doesn't it? It's that same little principle that we live now. You know, that wasn't, that wasn't my two-year-old's fault. That was your two-year-old's fault. We kind of have that in our little church now. My kid's perfect because he's like his dad. You know, perfectly perfect in every way. That little thing turns into, and then when they're 20, and they want to choose the way of Sodom, then you say, actually, that passage in Romans 1 isn't quite as clear as I used to think it was, and now that this thing called just grace covers everything. You can live however you want. No, you're bowing before sin instead of bowing before God. This is the world we live in. This is the result of these lukewarm churches. The result of the lukewarm churches is now their kids are attacking decent churches. We've got to stand strong, courageous. One day it will get to this, delivering up to death because they didn't accept their sin. 22, and you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end same shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over to the cities of Israel till the Son of Man become. I'm trying to hurry to get down to the end here. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of the household? Remember, they said Christ was of Satan. What are they going to call us? Things like cults, things like, you know, bad names. I want to mention them. 26 says, Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in the light, and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. That's the word of God. That's Romans 1. Heard it here, preach it on the housetop. Don't give up your freedoms in this nation for the idols of sin. Fear them not, 28, which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell like God and the rich man. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Remember the hairs of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They weren't singed a bit in that fiery furnace. Don't you worry about it. 
God will protect us. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. That's a promise. That's a promise. You confess Christ down on this earth. You stand for Christ down on this earth. They're having a conversation about your faith in heaven. I like that. I like that. I'm not so much worried about, oh my goodness, is my name going to be in the paper today? Oh my goodness, is my name going to be in some den of thieves yelling about me? I'm thinking more about, I want my name up there. I want a conversation being had. And like we said on Wednesday night, I want a celebration being had in heaven with angels over one sinner that comes to repentance. My mind is switching. I'm not worried about what this world's going to do to us. I'm worried about what God's going to do in this world. Whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I, am, I came not to send peace, but a sword. The man who I said, who is standing right with his family, he quoted this verse to me. I said, praise the Lord, you know your Bible. That's what you need to make the right decisions. You've got to know your Bible. He says, this is it. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law, against her mother-in-law. And a man's foe should be they of his own household. Don't lose that battle, Christian. I know we're talking of an extreme here of, of someone in your family really falling into sin, but I want you to take a stand on other things too. For the family right now in your life that thinks you shouldn't take the Bible seriously, you tell them to just go take a walk. You need to get serious about this Bible and get in church. When they try to tell you, well, you're being too zealous, or, oh, you're joining a cult, I've heard of that church, or, or you need to have more family time, you need to take this job that have you working every Sunday, you tell your family to shut up. Say, I'm going to serve the Lord. Have that kind of variance here that Christ talks about. Don't yield to that idol that is your family. Don't yield to that idol that is the esteem of your family. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Christ couldn't have said it much more plainly. We're not even worthy of the name we bear unless we carry this cross. And a big part of this cross is that sometimes you've got to stand up against our own families. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego looked like they were going to lose everything. They found everything. That poor man, Lazarus, looked like he had nothing, but he had everything. The rich man, on the other hand, looked like he had everything, but he had nothing. That's where we'll end today. He that findeth his life shall lose it. He that loses his life for my sake shall find it. I want Christians to find their lives in God's work and in God's will. And I want people who don't believe to find the Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you'd bless the reading of Scripture we've done this morning. Pray, Lord, that we would be sincere about this book, Lord, and not leave it here, but we'd be doers, not just hearers. We'd walk into this next week absolutely walking circumspectly and with our guard up, Lord, but also not beat down into silence, ready to stand up for you and your name, which is being slandered in so many ways, ready to stand for you and your book. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.